morning. Lord, I pray that you bless each heart and mind, Lord, that is participating in this meeting. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that our your hearts, minds, and spirits will be open for the teaching, Lord, and what my dad has to share, Lord, and what you may have to share, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, draw each one of us closer to you, Lord, day by day, Lord, as we walk in our journey, Lord, to find you, Lord, to become your sons, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. We're going to continue in Proverbs. Um, I think this week there's still some kind of foundational things that I'd like to talk about in relation to, <clears throat> or that can be applied to both uh, our approach to Proverbs as well as an approach to the Scriptures. Um, seems like I've had a lot of conversation recently about that general subject matter in terms of or as directly related to God's purpose. Um, one thing that I think about often in my own journey, uh, which at one point included Bible school, seminary, you know, studies in the scripture and even you know, getting a, a degree in biblical studies and thinking back on some of the ways that I was taught to <clears throat> approach the scriptures, to learn, to extract truth from the scriptures, um, how to interpret the scriptures. Um, and I see that, <clears throat> you know, there were a number of I guess you could say fundamental fundamental principles that were not right. What's interesting is that they weren't necessarily wrong either. They were the wrong, however, they were wrongly prioritized as a foundation. And so when you take something that is, let's just say, an idea or a, a notion that you have in your own mind, which is preconceived. It means it's the way you already think about it. Then you begin to interpret what you see and hear and understand through a mindset that is already settled. So... My dad, my father, and I have had a, a number of discussions about that over the years, and this applies generally to life. That being that what my dad would always say is, well, we all see everything through our own grid of understanding. So does everybody know what a grid is? I guess maybe you can picture it most easily as a series of intersecting lines that create you know, most of the time squares. So there are things that in your mind as you process things and as you understand what you're processing, there are things that you allow through, there are things that you don't allow through at all, and then there are things that you allow through having understood it in a particular way. So as it comes through that grid, it is broken down in your understanding and your perception in such a way that you can receive it and then you have your own understanding of it. And what you end up with may not be at all like the thing that was the truth before it came through that grid of understanding. And the way that we look at life <clears throat> and the way that we understand relationships Ultimately, the way that we interact in relationships and the way that we um, interact with others, the way that we understand God as a person, all come down to, we could call it a mindset, we could call it a culture, 
because it allows things to be perceived or understood in a certain way <clears throat> and not in others. And in, in other words, our interpretation of a circumstance in life or of a scripture or of uh, the nature of a particular relationship with another person, all will have its own understanding in our own mind. So in that sense, it's already all the decisions about whatever the nature of that is, whether it's a, a truth, a life circumstance, a life decision, or a, a relationship with another person or people in life, our understanding of what that means to us has already been decided. Are you guys following me a little bit in terms of how that is a, something that's established in us? So for my life personally, because that mindset or that set, that series of mindsets that made up my grid for understanding life, for understanding God, for understanding God's purposes, all of those things were set in place. So everything that happened to me in my life, every decision that I made in life, every personal relationship that I had in life, and my understanding of my relationship to God and my understanding of what it meant to believe in God, hear from God, follow God, obey God, and understand the truth of God and the truth in scriptures was all directly impacted by that set of understandings, beliefs, mindsets, by that grid. So for me, there were some things that were acceptable, some things that were not acceptable, some things that I interpreted in one way, and things that I interpreted in a whole other way. Now that's a very, I'm speaking very generally. And so, you know, then the question that comes to mind is, well, how do we know what is, what's the true standard? If, if that grid can be compared to a standard by which we put everything in the balance, it's how we, it's how we judge things, it's how we discern things. Well, if we cannot trust ourselves to that standard, then how do we know what is the true standard? And if there is such a true standard, then how do we come to know it? And then how also can that standard become the standard of our own life? Now that's not an easy question to answer. <laughs> Because that is a mighty work of God for it to be accomplished in a life like my own especially. Why? Why in my life in particular? Because the standard that I had already, that I was already bearing was with me for many years of my life. I had, it had taken a fundamental place in my mind in my heart, in my perspective. So when I began to, when, my, when the Lord began to open my eyes up to another standard, his standard, I won't be able to detail you how he did that. I, I will tell you it was not the direct revelation all the time. There were certainly things that God dealt with me very personally and directly on. But the revealing of God's standard came through other people, other circumstances, and through another deep, in many ways, unseen work of the Holy Spirit. So all to say, there were times that the Lord did speak to me, but I would also say that that was not the majority of the time. Most of, the most of the time that came through circumstances, 
circumstances were used by God to uh, expose or shine a light on or bring into the light those standards in my own life that did not match to his own standards. So that was difficult. That came, those circumstances were hardship. Another way that the Lord did that was through relationships with other believers in whom that standard had been maybe more uh, 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 further developed, that standard being God's standard, and through teaching that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. All of which come from a foundation which was God's standard, which we can also equate God's eternal purpose. It is in itself a plumb a plum line. And a plumb line, if everyone doesn't know how a plumb line works, it's a heavy weight, most of the time in the shape, kind of a triangulated shape down to a point at the end that hangs on the end of a string. Now, because of the laws of gravity, when you hold the plumb line out or when you tie a plumb line, even if you tie that plumb line to a, let's say that you tie the plumb line to a rod that is crooked, the plumb line itself, the line, the string, will not hang crooked, even if what it is attached to is crooked. The laws of gravity demand or require that that weight hang directly in a straight line. And that's therefore called plumb. That was used by the builders and, and still is by some builders. But it was the way to make something straight. If, it, if you were a, a mason or a bricklayer or a rock layer, a stone mason, and you wanted to build a wall and you wanted that wall to go straight, then you would set up a plumb line so that as you went up, you could follow that line. And when you were finished, if you followed that plumb line, then the, the wall that you built would be straight, unchanging, not because the rock or you know that process could not change, but because it followed something that did not change, that did not deviate, that stayed perfectly straight as a, as a proper bearing for the way to go, how to take the next step, where to lay the next stone. And that is the nature of God's eternal purpose. Now, God's eternal purpose is a general statement as God reveals what his eternal purpose is, specifically in relation to mankind, and as the scriptures reveal to us, his sons, then we be can begin to align our lives, our thinking, our decisions, our perspectives, our understanding of circumstances, and our relationships, and how we handle those relationships to that standard. And this is something that all of us should do all the time. There's never a time in, in life where your own life, your own decisions, the relationships you carry, the way that you think should not be put in comparison to the plumb line. Otherwise, your path in life becomes one that is crooked. It will, it will on its own. And I believe me, I, I've done the work of stonemasonry. And without the plumb line, no matter how straight you think you're going, you're going off somewhere. <laughs> the 
that's the nature of and the purpose of instruction, teaching. This is, sorry to interrupt you. This is such a beautiful story. Reminding me, just wanted to cheer me up a little bit, just uh, cheer myself up a little bit. I was a young boy. My father was amazing. He built a home. Oh, know? wow. So, yeah. So, one of the jobs for me to hold the plumb line for him. Oh, wow. Home, you know? So, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> this shiny object, you know. I used to say, what is this for? What is this for? You know, so. Yeah. I don't have any tool, but that's a must have, you know. Yeah. So. The other thing is that major, you know, that was uh, the w- bubble in the middle of the thing, you know. So yeah, the that bubble. Thing, yeah, we had to get it, you know. I remember the first time we get it, we don't have no tools, you know, yeah. in our whole life. First wow. time we get it, I said, what is that for, you know? Oh, we call lost money, you know. So <laughs> everybody has to raise that money, have team members, you know. Even people have to raise that money to buy it, you know, wow. expensive tools. So hmm. anyway, just for you to, for the young people to recognize, you know, they, someday maybe they can build a structure themselves yeah. to see how it works. So, yeah. Yeah. No, oh, thank you, brother. That's a... Uh... You know, I think the Lord has something unique here for us that's, you know, it, it's more valuable. And so uh, I'll, I'll in, a, in a bit kind of give some instruction as to what, what I would like for us to do for the next, w- next session. But there's something in particular valuable. I was re- as you mentioned that, and I thought of my own experiences with my father and building and construction, you know, those are not just fond, fond memories. You know, you can see the real life application of this scientific principle in relation to the laws that govern the universe, the created universe. And they are but a shadow. They, they are a reflection in many ways of a truth in reality. Now, it should be obvious enough that this it's this very truth and reality that we're wanting to s- that 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 even Solomon the teacher is wanting to pass on to his people one other little story though that i think will give us uh, some more context about foundation okay you know, the, the plumb line is even more important. Uh, Emmanuel mentioned an, another tool called a level. It's got a bubble in it, and you, 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 you make sure the, the, the bubble in this tool centers between two lines. Okay? So this is a, 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 a kind of a humorous illustration, but it was also uh, something that, to me, was a uh, very frustrating at the time. So, if you guys, I know Emmanuel remembers, uh, but Kayla and others, Elaine, you may remember as well. My kids may remember a little bit, but when, uh, if you remember Church Under the Bridge, um, there was a big van that we drove. And that van had a stage that would fold out of the side of it. And, you know, we used it to, to hold the equipment that we took down there and the sound system and things like that. So when we were doing some work on it one time and we were going to rebuild the inside of that van. And so my dad gave me the materials and some some instruction. And he said, here's how we want to build this and this is where we want to build this. Okay, so the van at that time was parked in the parking lot at... uh, at uh, the community center down there, downtown Austin. And so uh, me and another individual, we began to build. And we were building the walls inside this van. And so I, I had the right tools. I had uh, the level. I, I, we didn't use a plumb line. Most of the time you can, these days you can use a level. Now this is interesting because if I had, if I had a plumb line, then it would have probably shown me something a little different. So I began to build this wall. 
and I was using the level and making everything straight. And then a few hours later, after some progress in the construction, my dad walked by to see how things were going. Now, he was outside standing on the ground and looking into the van. And when he saw my building, he said, what are you doing? That is so crooked. And I was just completely confounded. And I said, well, it's not crooked. I argued with him. It's straight. And I said, let me prove it to you. So he humored me. <laughs> and I showed him. I put the level on my wall. Sure enough, the level showed that I was, it was right. But what was the problem? Does anybody know? <laughs> That's a funny. Uh. The problem was this. The van was not level. So I was actually leveling to a crooked foundation. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a, a very important lesson in relation to this the previous comments that I've made this morning if my assumption about my way of thinking and my way of life is that it's already the right foundation then the tools are useless to me. They cannot guarantee that what I build or what I construct is true. True is another word that can be used in as a synonym for plumb. Is the wall true? Is it square? Is it straight? Now, as an interesting observation of my life and what I had to go through personally as a, as a work of God, a disciplinary work of God, is perfectly illustrated in that example of my building. Because you know what my father said I had to do? It had to be torn down. Now that's a that's discouraging, disheartening. I was doing what I was told. I was using the right materials. I was using the right tools. My my intentions were right. I was being obedient to my father. And from what I could see and tell, the way that I was doing it was also good. But when my father came to make observation of the work, he had to say, that's not right. Now, in life, that's a hard thing to deal with, and that was my personal experience. Referring back to that particular event or circumstance, it was very frustrating, but it was pretty funny. In life, in my personal life, and how God had to deal with my life, my life was built in many ways in the same way. I was born into a loving home. I was provided for my whole life. I had loving parents. Parents who disciplined me in love. I grew up going to church. I went to Christian schools, went to a Bible college. I was working as a, in a ministry, as a leader in a ministry. I was preaching the word of God. It was at that point in my life that the Father in heaven came over to look at the quality of my work.
And that was when he said, uh oh, that's not right. So, in my inner man, when I began to think and challenge that in my own life, and in, you know, I didn't rebel against God in that season of my life, but my mind was just broken down to f try to figure out how I had missed it because I had seemed to have very carefully measured out what I was doing. And came to find that the foundation itself was not straight. It wasn't plumb. It, the foundation itself, had not been brought up to the right standard so that when I built on that foundation, what I built or what I was building would also be true, plumb. Straight, aligned with the standard. We could say hitting the mark. Now, with these stories and illustrations, let's revisit in our minds and in our hearts and our consideration of our own life and how to apply the truth of scripture, and more importantly, the fundamental and eternal purpose of God. What was the instruction that was given in the Torah? What was the meaning of the, 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 the name there? It was instruction so as to be able to hit the mark, to shoot an arrow, Solomon here in Proverbs is very much referring uh, through many different sayings and examples that come directly from the Torah, the fulfillment of it. They also, uh, you, you can see and hear through the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and the teachings of the apostles, as well as that, those of the prophets. These same references, not just to Proverbs, but to the Torah, the teaching of the law. What it was for, what it was meant to produce. God, from the very beginning, wanted the opportunity to, to lead, to teach. So we can see the heart of the teacher here, the purpose of these wise sayings, is to, to, to lay the foundation upon which your life can be built. Your life, the relationships that you have with others, how you receive and give in life and in those relationships and in the decisions you make and in the circumstances of your life, they all become the building blocks of your life. God would have you build up to, built up to be a house in which he can dwell. That's the recommendation and, the, and the, the exhortation of the Apostle Paul when he tells us that we should care about how we build our life, that we should care for this body, physical and spiritual, that is, as it is meant to be the dwelling place of God.
that's the nature of this, this teaching, these Proverbs. So, as I mentioned before, we're not going to go through a lot of verse by verse things. What I would like to do this week is still cover some of these fundamental uh, just principles that are laid out in the first section of this book. Because from here to the end, starting in chapter 10, there's a lot of, of wonderful truth. Things that should be regularly considered and applied to life with the right perspective. These are, in essence, the, the use of those tools, the level, the plumb line, the square. But without the right foundation, and that's what's really given in the first section of this book, without the right foundation, we could try to apply all of these principles and still not have a good building. Still be in a place where the father comes and says, uh-oh, that wasn't built on the right foundation. The encouragement or exhortation of the apostles in the, in, in the New Testament is that we need to be careful about the foundation. Some of those statements go as far as to say that when God comes to put the plumb line next to it, many will find that the quality of their work will have to be burned up. So he does that. That illustration is more in the substance of the work having built with that which perishes, wood, stay, wood hay, and stubble, rather than with the precious stones. So while that is an example using the material you build with, there's a direct parallel to the foundation that you're building upon. Because the Lord is not going to allow for a crooked, disjointed building. But let our minds not only dwell on the physiological or physical side here. We're talking about the construct of the human life and mind and soul. So there's a couple of the things that I want to discuss in re relation to uh, the, the principles that are laid out in the first eight or nine chapters of Proverbs. And then next week, what I'd like for you to do is finish your reading of the book of Ro uh, Proverbs. And I would like for you to highlight five to seven verses or sayings. That, that means they can be more than one verse, so don't, don't stick yourself to a single verse there. But let's take some of these as you read through. This will be an assignment for next week, so you might want to take a note on it So you, because I want everyone to participate in it. And as you choose those five to seven proverbs, I would also like for you to have some comments. You, you may want to write them down so that you don't forget on each. Having applied these fundamental principles of truth that are laid out by Solomon here in the early chapters. So in other words... You're going you're gonna to have some comments about how that particular proverb, how it applies to a man's life. Maybe how it applies to your life. In the context of the plumb line of God's purpose. So feel free to come to me and... You know, Taylor or Elaine, if you need further clarification on that, you can contact me directly or otherwise. And then we'll take some time next week in a little bit of a different format, primarily just to, to share and pray together. 
So back to some of these fundamental principles here. Last week, you have the recordings available if you want to listen to some of the some of the message from last week or some of the teaching from last week uh, in relation to the, 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 the first laying out of these fundamental principles. But I think that we are more generally aware because of the teaching over the last couple of years in the scriptures of what God's eternal purpose is and how he would have that fulfilled in and through the lives of his people, his sons, and made manifest making manifest his life, his love, and his wisdom, the wisdom of God, to all creation. This way of life that's being taught and encouraged to be passed on, that's something we looked at last week. We saw that when, when Moses had finished the, the dispensation of the law. And then he made recommendations of how it should be treated and practiced to the people, especially in the context of their families and children, how this way of life was to be passed on, and that the children of the coming generation would know why it was important. Not just what the standard is, but why the standard is the standard. What fruit it produces in the life of an individual and a community. And why that carries so much value. As Solomon writes in the Proverbs, it's more valuable than silver or gold. Jesus in his parables compared the kingdom, which is this culture, this way of life, the full inhabitation of God in the midst of his people, the kingdom, as those same precious things, a hidden treasure, precious pearl, something of great value, something that holds more value than anything else in life because in the parables, those who found those treasures were willing to give up all that they had to obtain them. So Jesus ultimately would also say, seek ye first this way of life, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First, the first priority, the plumb line, the standard, the square, the level. The true north, the right path, the straight path. The path of the righteous, the highway of the holy. The right way. The good way. So we can see, and we mentioned this, that nearly every chapter, especially in this first section of the book, starts as a recommendation from a father to a son and listening to the advice of the parents. We also made some uh, observation uh, between the difference between wisdom as being presented as a woman and the folly of the fool as he seeks after the, uh, the, the way of the adulteress. So there is also an exhortation throughout this entire book to be wary of, to be warned against, and to stay away from the adulterous woman. Now, adulterous, by definition, is a wayward, or un, it means a wayward woman, uncontrolled, unbridled, having a stubborn or perverse way of life. This goes beyond our a, a more um, simplistic understanding of what a, an adulteress or is, what a what a, a, a prostitute is. And there is a difference between the two. One is the selling 
of self. They can both be the, uh, the, the main difference between the adulteress and the prostitute is that the adulteress has a commitment to a husband and is forfeiting that commitment, that covenant. So when the Lord says, do not uh, commit adultery, it is not simply saying, it's not just talking about relations between a man and a woman. It's talking about the breaking of a covenant. And that's why Solomon here, in several chapters in the beginning, makes a comparison between the w wisdom as a person and the adulteress as a per person. One is a covenant keeper, and the other despises the covenant, breaks the covenant, denies the covenant, walks away from the covenant. So then, here in Proverbs, what does the adulteress really represent? You can read the examples. The illustrations that are given here are specific illustrations of a woman enticing another man into her bed. So, but what is the spiritual correlation there? What is the true message that's being communicated? That there's another wisdom, there's another way of life, and it's very alluring and, and enticing. It seems good, he will later say, but in the end, it leads to death. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go over to James for a moment, the book of James in the New Testament. Before we go to chapter 3, let's look at chapter 1. Let's keep in mind, we may briefly touch on Hebrews 12 as well. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Because this is something that is recommended all throughout the Proverbs. In fact, these are direct quotation from Proverbs. <laughs> Early in verse, chapter 12, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He endured the shame and suffering of the cross. Now in verse 5, he, he says this, Hebrews 12, 5. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. A direct quotation from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son... Do not make light. Do not despise. Do not think it as unvaluable. Rather, treat it as very valuable, as a treasure, as a great benefit to your life, the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. All through Proverbs, Solomon says, the few, the only the fool cannot accept a rebuke because they don't understand what a rebuke is even for. It is for your good. It's spoken out of love. It's meant to turn you back to the way of truth. It's a plumb line. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Now look at this perspective as he continues. Endure hardship as discipline. That means whatever circumstance of life. 
God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us, and we respect them for it. We know that they do it because they love us, and they want the right, the good thing for our lives. That's why they do it. But there's still a difference between the discipline of our earthly father and the discipline of our heavenly father, and here's what it is. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a little while until we were adults, made our own decisions. As they thought best. But, and he says, here's the difference between their discipline and God's discipline. God disciplines us for our good. That we may share in his holiness. He knows what it will produce in us. No discipline is pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. Now there's a qualifier here because it is impossible to not submit under the discipline of God. But for those who are trained by it, who have submitted to it, who are willing to endure it as something good for their life, it produces a harvest and right of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. This, we can see, is one of the entire recommendations that Solomon said that his father David had to him. And who told him was the most valuable thing. To the extent that when David was gone and Solomon became king of Israel. And he came to the father seeking the face of God. And the father, the God said, ask of me whatever you want and I will give it to you. And because of the teaching of his father David. Solomon said and requested wisdom to lead the people. And that was pleasing to the Father. Now moving over to James. We're going to see the comparison of these two wisdoms. One by this example here in chapter 1. And in line with what the author of Hebrews, Paul just said, let's look at James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What did the author of Hebrews just say? Endure hardship as discipline. Same principle. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. What did he have said in uh, 12, 1? Uh, 12, 2? Let us run with perseverance. And perseverance, verse 4 in James 1, must finish its work so that you may be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given, but don't doubt. This we talked about when we studied James. He's going to give you these things to go through, and his discipline hand of discipline will be on your life so that you can learn the way of wisdom. And he does it because it's good. And it produces a harvest of righteousness. Let's move down to verse 12. James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under these hardships and trials, the discipline of God, because... When he has stood the test, when he has been trained by it, he will receive the crown of life 
that God has promised to those who love him. What did Jesus say? If you love me, what? You will obey me. You will follow my commands. When tempted, no one should say, well, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Do we want to know how it happens? How, does this, how is a man enticed and lured by this adulterous woman, by another way of life? How would he forsake the covenant of God and seek out or follow after or be enticed by the covenant of death, a way of life that leads to death? It's here. But each one is tempted when his own by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Do you see the correlation here in the language of lying with the woman and what it produces? This is the same kind of language. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Let's move over to chapter 3. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? The two words of the three, knowledge included in Proverbs, that are used throughout the writing. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let's not imagine that both Paul and James are not thinking directly of the law of Moses and directly of the teachings of Solomon when they say what they say and when they're teaching what they're teaching here. It's exactly what they're teaching. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by his way of life, by the wisdom of life he lives, by the culture that he carries. How is that expressed? In the decisions you make, in the kind of relationships you have, in the way that you treat those relationships. All of these things. Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast it about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, that way of life, go see what's going on. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and unspiritual. Two kinds of wisdom. The earthly and unspiritual version here we can equate or parallel to the way of folly or the way of the adulteress in Proverbs. I want you, I'm saying all this so that you guys have a, a context for when the adulterous woman is mentioned throughout the book of Proverbs and in some entire chapters, that you, you understand what's being communicated there. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So he had just mentioned in chapter 1, receiving the crown of righteousness. Now we can see that it is the harvest of righteousness that is produced in the lives of those who live in this way. Do not ignore God's covenant, his promise. Do not turn away from his purpose, the plumb line. Set this as the standard in your life, in your mind, your heart, your soul. And walk in this way. Pursue this way as a treasure. This will be to heed the call of wisdom. To listen to her voice and to apply understanding to her words, to that truth. 
you will see as you read through Proverbs the constant recommendation and benefit of discipline of prudence and as you guys have written about recently of being mindful as opposed to being mindless so we will finish up there today I know we have not as I mentioned read much of Proverbs that's going to be have been your assignment for the last couple weeks and for the next week and what I would like for you to do uh, for our next time is to gather those five to seven proverbs with some of your own observations and comments and we will use those as a means of a more interactive discussion for our next session and then after that we may take a week break and then move into uh, the Psalms. So we'll finish there today. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.